Okay, I think we're about ready to begin. And I want to welcome you this afternoon to our uh, Chair's Air Pollution Seminar. And uh, we're very lucky and honored today to have Dr. John Freunds from the University of California, Los Angeles. He's Director of UCLA's Center for Occupational Environmental Health. Um, John's had a long and distinguished career looking at uh, air pollution related research, especially on the health effects of air pollution. Particulate matter is a, a, a fundamental part of his research, as well as looking at lung cancer and non cancer health effects um, attributable to air pollution, as well as the biochemical mechanisms related to the toxicity of uh, air pollution. Um, in addition to that, John's conducted research on carcinogenicity and uh, of other toxics, including asbestos, beryllium, chromium, and conducted uh, extensive research on some of the mechanisms of arsenic-related systemic cancers. John has also served as the uh, chair of the Carcinogen Committee of the National Toxicology Board of Scientific Counselors, and he is chairman now of the state's scientific review panel on toxic air contaminants. In fact, he's the last of the original members of that uh, committee. It's been going on for, what, 20, 20 years now? Um, the reason John's here today, of course, is he's director of the Southern California Particle Center, which is a center funded by the United States Environmental Protection Agency and uh, to look at the effects of particulate matter on human health. So with that, I'll uh, ask John to begin. I did. I think I'm on. I'm on. I always worry about introductions, you know, when they they talk about your long career and your distinguished career, which which all that really means is you're getting old as the hills. And <laughs> uh, I oh I need to apologize to all of you. Um, today because I I have a very bad cold, very bad flu, and um, I can't hear almost anything in my, as you can tell, my nose is uh, blocked up. And so we'll just go as long as we can and hopefully uh, we'll uh, be okay. Um, the uh, what I want to do today is different than what I have done in the past and and to uh, uh, perhaps uh, emphasize some chemistry more than I might have done uh, at other times. Um, and the reason I'm, I want to do this particular talk is I, I at one level I think we're failing in our research agenda. I, th I think that, that we don't have uh, enough uh, integration of research and I think it hurts, hurts us and I think it limits what we can uh, actually uh, d derive from some of the research that we've been doing. And so I'm going to try and show, talk about how the paradigm that we use to try and make sense out of some of the uh, things that we're finding, and uh, hopefully it'll make sense. I don't need to say anything more about that. I think you don't know most of these players. And uh, I, I wanted to start out, though, by emphasizing this study that's really about a week old, because I think it's extremely important. Basically, it's a study uh, out of the University of Washington across multiple cities, and it is, uh, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine a week or so ago, and it has uh, very dramatic findings insofar as it reports a relative risk of 1.76 for death in postmenopausal women from coronary heart disease for every 10 microgram per cubic meter in the mean concentration of PM 2.5. I, th I think this will go down as being one of the most important studies that have been published in, in recent years 
and it certainly indicates that the, the risks we're talking about are not negligible. What I want to talk about today is really the third bullet point, namely, if studies can identify intrinsic factors that lead to increased adverse cardiovascular disease, then it should be possible to offer focused interventions to persons at greater risk. And that's what this talk is about. I want to, I want to assume the first bullet. That is, I want to assume that we have a, an extremely serious problem that we're dealing with, and in terms of cardiovascular disease, that what we know has been increasing uh, uh, continuously over the past five to seven to eight years. And, but I really still think that we are not doing the best work in terms of identifying intrinsic factors. The children's self study, which cost $30 million at USC, was a great study. It provided enormously important work. But when they were finished, they still cannot tell you what were the intrinsic factors that led to the effects in children's health. And uh, there are other examples. We're doing studies now down in Long Beach where we're going to be making masses of, of exposure measurements. And again, when we're finished, the question will be, <coughs> do we know what's going on and what are, what are the factors that are causally related? And I really want us to get on a soapbox about this because I think it's really to the degree that our, our research is piecemeal that we lose uh, that ability. Anyway, uh, going from there, uh, this is just a quick history. Uh, originally, the PM Center at UCLA was started not by EPA but by the ARB that supported the development of of particle concentrators and application to human clinical and animal toxicology studies. And so our first five years really was uh, uh, the ben we benefited from ARB. Then we uh, received funding from US EPA. And then we got a, then we received a super site program. And I should say for those of you that are familiar with the super site, US EPA super site program, the good news is I'm writing the final draft document on the health benefits from the SuperSite program. The bad news is that chapter is going to be relatively brief, and it reflects one of some of the problems that I'm, I'm concerned about in terms of uh, sometimes our overemphasis on emissions measurements. Then we receive funding from the <laughs> AQMD to create an asthma consortium, which has been recently refunded and is going on, and we've had the PM Center renewed for five years, and so we're into our, we are now into our seventh year of research. <coughs> now, during the time, I'll just go quickly through this. I think we've shown, and I'll show you a little bit about that atmospheric chemistry is important that ultrafine particles play an important role. We now recognize that a wider range of target issues and health endpoints are associated with PM exposure, and including developmental effects from Beata Ritz, exacerbation of atherosclerosis from a number of people, uh, uh, exacerbation of asthma, again, a number of people, and Mike Kleinman and our work on neurologic consequences, which if I have time, I'll talk about. <laughs> and that it's our impression that mobile sources are highly relevant to public health risks, and I think we've improved the mechanistic understanding of PM toxicity, and that's what I'm going to emphasize. Now, the, just to go quickly, I think some of you have undoubtedly seen this. At, at UCLA, our view of the mechanistic hypotheses associated with PM toxicity is that Particulate matter contains pro-oxidative chemicals, that organic chemicals and metals located on the PM matrix are responsible for toxicity, that initially we thought that everything was due to PM generating reactive oxygen species. Now we would not agree with that. We think it's much more complicated than simply generating reactive oxygen species, and we think the role of electrophilic chemistry 
and irreversible covalent bonding is extremely important. Obviously, both these can lead to oxidative stress. And I'm going to show you, mention just one study we're doing on looking at signal transduction pathways <coughs> that are relevant. Also, we now know without question that the PM matrix, the elemental carbon matrix, is also capable of transferring electrons and reducing oxygen to produce reactive oxygen species. Oxidative stress obviously produces pro-inflammatory effects. Inflammation affects pathophysiology of, of asthma, cardiovascular effects, and other endpoints. Failure in the antioxidant defense plays a role in susceptibility to PM-induced adverse health impacts. I'll say a little bit about genetics if I have a chance. And I want to emphasize something here that I haven't emphasized in the past, and that is irreversible chemical reactions result in chronic toxicity as a result of steady state exposure. So when we are breathing vapors in the LA basin, when we're breathing particles in the LA basin, we are dealing with a steady state concentration. So we are dealing, we are addressing, we are exposed to these materials on a constant basis that can produce irreversible effects that can produce therefore cumulative and chronic irreversible disease in the long run. And, and that's why, <coughs> that's why <laughs> in our view, small concentrations of materials can have quite significant effects. Now, this you've seen in the past. Andre Nell has shown it. I've shown it. This is just to remind you, this is an early view of mechanistic pathways, and I'm not going to spend any time because it's a, it, we now would argue that this is something of an oversimplification, and that is that the cell response pathways, normal, we have normal cells, uh, with exposure over time, we create antioxidant defenses, which results ultimately in, if overwhelmed, in inflammation and subsequent toxicity. <coughs> now, this is what this talk is about. This is what we do, and this is the way we think research should be done in terms of this field. The first thing that we do, this, this slide is the most important slide I'm going to show. Here's what we do. We first always, without question, characterize the physical and chemical properties of the particulate matter and vapor phase co-pollutants in relation to sources. So our first, our first goal is to characterize emissions vis-a-vis -vis sources. Secondly, we use chemical assays that we've developed to quantitatively as assess PM and vapor characteristics whoops, in relation to the initial stages of toxicity. Third, we link biological assays with progression of toxicity in cellular systems. In other words, Third, we are developing roadmaps for downstream processes in a biological context for toxicity. Fourth, we conduct in vivo studies to confirm the predicted outcomes based on the mechanistic inferences and the chemical and biological assays that I've talked about before. One, two, three, four, five. Fifth, we conduct human clinical and epidemiologic studies to confirm the pathway. And as I say down at the bottom, the objective is to develop a coherent roadmap to explain toxicity. And in our view, in our view, you have to do all five, and they have to be coordinated. So that when we're doing the characterization, we need to be doing the chemical assays, we need to be doing the biological assays, and we need to be doing the in vivo studies. And so we need to be doing these simultaneously and in concert with each other. And in the end, that will tell you, we hope, <coughs> what's going on. So this is the model that, that we use and we would argue others should use as well. And unfortunately, it's, that's not the way it goes. Now, <coughs> at this point, I'm going to make a huge leap 
and tell you about some work that we've been doing that uh, doesn't have anything to do with anything I've said so far. So bear with me. Uh, you know, if you're sick, you can claim any. Okay, this is uh, PAHs in the LA Basin. This is nanograms per cubic meter. This is picograms per cubic meter. <clears throat> I'm going to emphasize two compounds, benzoapyrene, which everybody knows is a powerful carcinogen, and naphthalene. <coughs> naphthalene, of course, is found in the vapor phase. And this, I want to emphasize that we should not only look at particulate matter, but we need to look at vapor phase co-pollutants. And this is it in a number of sites across the LA basin. And you can see that the average concentration of naphthalene is around 500 nanograms, and the average concentration of BAP is about 100 um, picograms. So that when you look at the uh, uh, PAH exposure in the Los Angeles basin, it's, it's, uh, it, it varies quite dramatically. And so, for example, if the average <coughs> in Riverside is 575 nanograms per cubic meter, and the average of BAP is 47, that means that the naphthalene to, to BAP ratio is 12,200. And so we talk a lot about these potent carcinogens, but we have to keep in mind that when we actually look at exposure, that the, the, the dominate ex, dominant exposure, and in fact, the exposure that accounts for 95% of all PAHs in the LA basin are the vapor phase PAHs. We've measured levels of naphthalene as high as 5 to 6,500 6, nanograms per cubic meter in Mira Loma and Riverside. That would give you over a 100,000 ratio. <coughs> now, <coughs> I should say parenthetically, PAHs are important compounds, quite crucial compounds, as I'll show you, but they do not cause toxicity. In fact, PAHs are surrogates for other, for other compounds, namely oxygenated species. And so, oops. So, if, if you are exposed to naphthalene here in the body, it, gets, it forms an epoxide, and the point is not to go through all this chemistry, but in terms of in vivo metabolism, I just want to point out that ultimately it produces two extremely important compounds, namely 1,4-naphthoquinone and 1,2-naphthoquinone. Now, uh, this epoxide is formed <coughs> initially, Frank Gilliland at USC has shown that fast metabolizers here with epoxide hydrolase of naphthalene are at greater risk of asthma, which is consistent with the formation of highly reactive quinones. In other words, if this pathway is rapid because of the genetics of the individual, that will lead to the formation of the quinones more rapidly, and that seems to be consistent with high risk of asthma in children. So one pathway for forming these highly reactive quinones from naphthalene is by metabolism. The second pathway is atmospheric chemistry. Here's 1,2-naphthoquinone and here's 1,4-naphthoquinone. And notice that 1,4-naphthoquinone as we go east tends to grow, and so we are forming 1,4-naphthoquinone, as well as 9,10-phenanthroquinone, which I won't talk about. But that what we did was a study where we calculated where parcels of particles would be as a function of wind speed, and we, and we basically <coughs> are operating the assumption that these particles, that naphthoquinones are being formed as we move east across the basin. So we have... One, we have naphthalene at high concentration, we have naphthalene metabolizing to naphthoquinones, and we have naphthoquinones being formed as we go across the basin, although I won't get into this, but 1,2-naphthoquinone 
uh, is not, does not appear to grow as you go across the basin. It's highly reactive and uh, is really a tailpipe phenomenon. Okay, to talk about 1,2-naphthoquinone, it has both redox and electrophilic properties. It's present in volatile and particle fractions. And most importantly, this compound, 1,2-naphthoquinone, produces contraction of smooth muscles, remodeling of lung cells, that is, the remodeling of cells leading to goblet cells, mucin production leading to exacerbation of asthma. So one, we have shown with a number of studies that 1,2-naphthoquinone, not only do we find it in the, in the LA basin, but the evidence is, seems to be extremely clear that it is responsible, at least in part, for the exacerbation of asthma. And again, to reemphasize the potential for chronic effects. <clears throat> and I, I won't go in, this is uh, one four, and I won't go in, I won't spend any time on this uh, slide. It, all I'm trying to point out here is that these quinones react with proteins by something called Michael addition reactions and form these irreversible uh, covalent bond formation and recovery from these, this chemistry is uh, based on resynthesis of the altered species. And this is a, a good example of the 1,2-naphthoquinone. As you see, as the 1,2-naphthoquinone concentration increases, that uh, we see concentration-dependent contraction of guinea pig trachea by 1,2-naphthoquinone. So we think that 1,2-naphthoquinone is quite definitely involved in, in the exacerbation of asthma. It's a surrogate. It's not the only compound that can produce this kinds of effects, but it's one that very clearly does. And we've been developing the roadmap for how this works, and I'm not going to say anything about this. I just want to show you that 1,2-naphthoquinone binds with a protein called PTP1B, which activates something called the epidermal growth factor receptor and then that leads to a whole series of activation of, of kinases, which end up in the nucleus, and that this process, uh, this, is, this is the roadmap that the, this chemical follows to produce the effects uh, that is the exacerbation of asthma. I won't say more about that. So what we have is naphthoquinone and other reactive compounds are in particle matter and in the vapor phase. They, they inactivate protective enzymes in epithelial cells. They activate the EGFR receptor. They activate the receptor and downstream proteins. They cause changes in sensory in the autonomic nervous system. They produce changes in bronchial smooth muscle. They increase calcium content and contraction. And they result in a reduction of, in airway diameter and exacerbation of asthma. <coughs> so this is a very good example of a process that we've demonstrated that shows, in a sense, the complete pathway for, the, for this particular uh, class of compounds that are found in extremely high concentration in, south, in the South Coast Basin. Now, <coughs> so this is just, I'm going to run quickly through this. I basically want to show you the assays, and I think many of you have seen some of them before, that quantitatively characterize the first steps in the chemistry and toxicity based on knowledge of chemical reactivity of vapor and PM constituents. So we have developed electrophilic assays, that is to measure irreversible chemistry, and <coughs> those assays can quantitatively quantitatively measure the binding of proteins, uh, the binding of proteins with uh, uh, PM and vapor phase constituents, and the proteins that we use are GADPH, I left the P out, and PTP1B. And then we have an assay that we measure the first stages of reactive oxygen species formation it's called the DTT assay, and uh, we have another assay called DHBA, which measures the for quantitatively measures the formation of the 
of the hydroxyl radical. In other words, we have a tool, tools to measure the first stages of, of all the chemical processes that really are underway <coughs> uh, in the first steps of toxicity. So one is the electrophile assay. Uh, we use glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to hydrogenase. It's a protein of high concentration in most cells. It forms covalent bonds between uh, uh, thiolate functions on the protein and electrophiles. And the extent of covalent bond can be measured by measuring enzyme activity. So here we have benzoquinone, which many of you are familiar with. And it binds with GAPDH, and we can measure enzyme activity on a quantitative basis, and I won't go into this. But this is just one example of, of, uh, of a very highly reactive, highly toxic compound that we can quantitatively assess its activity <coughs> within PM and uh, in the vapor phase. And here's a GAPDH and D and diesel, exact, diesel ex extracts, and you can again see that diesel extracts are very active. That is that diesel extracts contain significant amount, amounts of electrophilically active compounds. And so we can get an estimate of the, of the uh, degree of electrophilicity within diesel exhaust particles. <laughs> now, I'm switching to reactive oxygen species, and let's take our quinone again. If a quinone picks up an electron, say, from NADPH or some other species, and it forms a semiquinone, the semiquinone can then react with oxygen, and it produces superoxide anion radical. And what does this, what does this look like? In other words, We've formed, taken the quinone, gone to the semiquinone, gone to back to the quinone. So this process cycles so that this process will continue indefinitely. This is a catalytic process. And so with one molecule of quinone on a particle, we can produce tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of superoxide radical anion mo molecules. The same thing occurs with with superoxide going to hydrogen peroxide, <coughs> you have a metal and a quinone. In this case, the metal acts as a catalyst in something called Fenton chemistry, and this process recycles, and so you can produce, again, catalytically, thousands, hundreds of thousands of molecules of hydroxyl radicals. So an important set of, of assays that we use are assays that tell us how redox active are these particles? How much uh, superoxide radical anion is being formed and how, many, how much hydroxyl radical is being formed? Now, uh, never mind, we'll forget that. And <coughs> that slide just shows you that when you, take, when you take diesel particles and coat it with benzoapyrene, and you look at what happens to the lungs of animals, you see quinones are formed uh, in the lungs of animals. In other words, quinones are being metabolically formed from BAP uh, metabolism. Here, this shows, uh, remember, remember I talked about antioxidant defenses? This shows you the assay that measures redox activity, that is superoxide radical anion formation and how it correlates with uh, antioxidant defense systems. And if you look at, again, redox activity in particles in Southern California, looking at freeways, source sites, that is USC downtown, and receptor sites out, for example, in Upland or Claremont out there, you can see that the most potent, uh, most potent activity is with the ultrafine particles. So in every case, in every case, we are finding that ultrafine particles possess the greatest redox activity, and we would argue that that is because the particles are small, the surface area is great, and there are more active compounds on the surface of the particles uh, 
and, and, and <coughs> thereby able to uh, uh, generate superoxide radical anion. Now here's some, a bunch of studies we've done with that same assay in a number of different places. And uh, we have a lot of results which I won't go through. But basically we find that, again, that the redox activity of particles are correlated primarily with PAH concentration. So that <coughs> in general, and this we've seen in a number of occasions, we find that there is a uh, uh, reasonable correlation with organic carbon, as you might expect, but also in general with PAHs. These are the low molecular weight PAHs, and there's, the correlation isn't as high because uh, we think there's some vapor phase issues going on here. But in general, uh, redox activity on particles is found in the ultrafine fraction, and it correlates best with PAHs. And again, it's not the PAHs, is what they ultimately become. And this is an assay that uses a score bait to measure, again, superoxide radical ion chemistry and formation of, of hydrogen peroxide. Now, this assay is also interesting because if we then take, if we, if we run the first half with a score bait, and then we add aspirin to it, the aspirin reacts with hydroxyl radical and gives us these two products, which we can measure quantitatively. So this is an assay using aspirin that gives us a quantitative estimate of hydroxyl radical. This is an interesting, this is an interesting uh, assay because theoretically one could use this assay in human studies. One could use this assay and give people aspirin and if you could work out all the problems that would be inherent within that, one could measure uh, internal concentrations of hydroxyl radical if one were interested in that. So these are the chemical assays that form the basis for the chemistry that we do. Uh, and just to indicate, see, naphthoquinone forms superoxide radical anion. If I put a chelator in there, nothing happens. If I run an assay with ferrous ammonium sulfate and I put a chelate in there, all my activity goes away. All my activity goes away with DHBA. In other words, we can separate the stages of reactive oxygen formation. We can separate superoxide radical anion from hydroxyl formation. And that's really a measure of, of metals versus organics. All right. <laughs> so th those are the tools that we have been using to try and characterize the chemistry of the initial stages of PM toxicity. Uh, I, I'm going to shift now and, and talk a little bit about some studies that we've done. And it, pr principally, these are, this is work of Andre Nels and to... <coughs> And to just show you a little bit about why we think ultrafines are important. Here's a normal artery. Basically, as atherosclerosis develops, you have the uptake, uptake of low-density lipoprotein. And you start to form cells called foam cells. Now, over time, as the process develops, you not only have foam cells, but those cells start to die and you get something called lipid-rich necrotic cells. And so you have cell death and you have fibrous material and, and dead cells from both necrosis and apoptosis. At the same time, at the same time that this is occurring, these uh, arteries are taking up lymphocytes and monocytes and those monocytes differentiate, differentiate, grow and differentiate and form foam cells. And those foam cells are engorged with low density lipid cholesterol. So, whoops. Uh, uh, 
Okay, so what's happening here is the the these uh, in every case these um, either the the foam cells or the <coughs> necrotic cells are engorged with low density LDL, low density lipoprotein. Now, high density lipoprotein actually acts to block that process. And I'm not going to go into that. This is not a, an anatomy lecture. Uh, but but there are obviously high-density lipoprotein has plays the effect of reducing the uptake of uh, LDL and also inhibits the inflammatory processes, which is what we're talking about here. So over time, you see you create a vulnerable plaque that has a thin fibrous core and has a very large necrotic core. And then basically a heart attack is when you have the bursting through this thin fibrous cap of these necrotic cells and that uh, obviously blocking blood flow in the, in the uh, uh, artery. And... This would take me a long time to explain, but you can see we have monocytes being taken up. The monocytes differentiate to become macrophages. Over time, the macrophages die, and you start to have this necrotic buildup here. You have low-density lipoprotein, LDL, starts to become oxidized. Over time, that 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 LDL, there are two stages. One is a low, one is an early stage of oxidation, and one is a later stage of oxidation. And so, at the later stage of oxidation, you have the uh, uh, the effect of which is the killing off of the macrophage foam cells and forming, as you can see, this lipid-rich necrotic core. And then, obviously, this is the beginning of a breakthrough <coughs> and a myocardial infarction. So this is a complicated process, but in fact, what we're doing is we're studying the, ox the first stage oxidation of low density lipoprotein. We're studying the second stage oxidation of low density lipoprotein. We're studying monocyte and lymphocyte uptake <laughs> and we're trying to characterize the steps involved in these processes. And in particular, we are interested in the steps that are involved in the inflammatory process that ultimately leads to the kind of complicated chemistry that we see here. Now, there have been a number of studies in, of atherosclerosis in animal models. One is a PM10 study in Watanabe rats. I should say parenthetically that the Watanabe rat is not any longer a very popular uh, animal model for these kinds of studies. Uh, but I'll show you the results anyway. And there were work done at NYU looking at APOE mice, which are an mice that are sensitive to the development of atherosclerosis. And there have been two studies uh, at NYU and as you can see, this is a four-week study, basically, with the, with the Watanabe animals. And you can see that the, in terms of the volume fraction of atherosclerotic lesions that the animals exposed to PM10 were, uh, had a greater volume fraction of atherosclerotic regions, lesions. <coughs> <coughs> In the more recent study at NYU done by Mort Lippmann and his colleagues, we see a much longer study in which the animals were fed chow, they were fed uh, fresh air, filtered air, pardon me, and PM 2.5. And, and as you can see, you see in terms of the plaque area, there's an increase in the plaque area associated with PM 2.5. 
I won't go into the uh, uh, the rest of that data, but you can see three nitrotyrosine endothelial nitric oxide synthase, inducible nitro oxide synthase, and you can see that in general there is an evidence for oxidative stress processes uh, going on. In a high fat diet, they did a similar study, a <coughs> four month study, and here you see, uh, interestingly enough, uh, statistically significant results with the plaque area, and so with the high fat chow diet, you see somewhat different results than uh, we're seeing with the normal chow diet. And keep that in mind because I'm going to come to that in a second because we did not see that. So our hypothesis for, for our, in terms of our work is PM synergizes with known proatherogenic stimuli and mediators in their ability to elicit oxidative stress slash inflammatory processes and promote atherosclerosis. Most of the proatherogenic potential resides in ultrafine particle fraction, highly enriched in redox cycling or electrophilic PM chemicals. And so, oh, by the way, this is pictures of our trailer. You can just see it off in the corner there. That's just LA. This is our trailer. This is our trailer we bring out from Michigan State every year at a cost of somewhere around $25,000. We would very much like to have a trailer like that in Southern California so we don't have to bring a trailer out from Michigan State every year. This is a $600,000 trailer. It has the advantage that we can keep the animals in a vivarium overnight so we can stay at the site of the experiment Wherever we want to move that trailer, we can move it. And so we, we're doing studies in Riverside, at USC, on freeways, and so on and so forth. The advantage of the trailers, I say, is we can keep the animals there rather than what Mike Kleiman has to do, which is with his little trailer, is every night we do the experiments during the day, and every night we take the trailer back to UC Irvine. Well, I don't think I have to tell you that that's not the best protocol for the kinds of studies that need to be done. <coughs> so this is a not so subtle plea for a trailer. <coughs> so this is a study that we did. Did this is animals? Animals at UCLA. They're happy. They don't have to move anywhere. They just sit in the vivarium at UCLA. God damn it. Uh, then we have filtered air, and somebody who's smart, when I show you the results, is going to say, what about the vapor phase compounds? Because no, ev everybody talks about the particles, but nobody ever talks about the vapor phase. That's why I did that first set of experiments. If I wanted to, to start thinking about, does are any of these results relevant to vapor phase compounds? So... This is a five-week study, as you can see. We expose them to ultrafine part. Uh, I'm sorry, PM 2.5 to ultrafine particles. We looked at uh, aortic atherosclerotic assessment. We looked at lipid profile. We looked at plasma hydroperoxides and tissue gene expression. And I should say, just so you understand, that we are also characterizing the PM as we do these studies, and we're also doing these chemical assays I've talked about. So we're trying to develop a, a, a complete picture. And this is uh, what you obviously know, uh, that ultrafines have a lot more organic carbon than PM 2.5. They have fewer metals. They have more elemental carbon. So this just gives you a, a, a sense of the difference between ultrafine. And, of course, we would argue that the reason that ultrafines are important is that there are these, there is so much surface area for oxygenated compounds, for organic compounds and for metals to be on the surface rather than buried in the insides of the larger particle. 
And here are the results that we found. As you could see, the uh, in terms of aortic lesions, this is the, this by the way is the first time not the first time this has been shown in a talk, but it's the first time it's ever been reported. Basically, you can see the animals at UCLA have the lowest number of aortic lesions. The filtered air have the next, but greater than <coughs> the UCLA animals. Uh, fine particles uh, obviously show an effect, and ultrafine show uh, an even more dramatic effect. So this is the first finding of aortic lesions associated with ultrafine particles. And if you'll notice, the Chow study was five months. The Sun study was six months. The current study is five weeks. And so you can see, I think, that uh, in our study, the uh, proatherogenic material is uh, 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 much greater. And I missed I miss something on that slide that didn't show up. The PM 2.5 is to the left there, and the red, not gray, is the ultrafine. So how does it work? The first thing we ask ourselves is, what happens to the lipids? Well, look at the lipids. The lipids don't seem to change. So we're not affecting the level of the lipids. Uh, the, the HDL is, remains identical to, <coughs> basically, to uh, be, be at all sites with, for all animals. But in, if one is interested in oxidative stress, the ultrafine particles generate by far the most oxidative stress. Uh, and in this case, we're looking at liver, mountain, dialdehyde. And so this is a systemic effect that we're seeing oxidative stress uh, in the animal. And I'm not going to go through all these enzymes. These are all uh, phase two enzymes for the most part, not, not counting NRF2. But these are all phase two enzymes. And you can see that the, the ultrafine particles uh, stimulate the expression of, of antioxidant, antioxidant enzymes uh, designed to minimize oxidative stress uh, to a larger degree than any of the other uh, 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 test subject. And so we think that this, clearly this is uh, illustrative of antioxidant responses to the ultrafine particles. <coughs> Now, this is interesting, <coughs> and this is in co conflict with what I told you before, because this is apoe no mice on a high-fat diet. And on a high-fat diet, notice we get no differences. Remember I showed you the previous slides where they did get differences? Well, we don't. So we don't, so it appears that the signal, the signal that we're getting from the ultrafines is being washed out by the high-fat diet. I don't know what you conclude from that. I guess you should conclude better not to have a high-fat diet and breathe as much as you want. But seriously, uh, <coughs> but. When we feed the animals high-fat diet, we get, again, these very striking results from the, the expression of these en, uh, antioxidant enzymes. So there is chemistry going on that is protective chemistry. And that's, that's an interesting finding that is, is, needs further explanation. So to summarize, <coughs> PM exposed mice develop greater atherosclerotic lesions than all other mice. Ultrafine particles lead to a lo loss of protective inflammatory profile of plasma HDL. I didn't show you that data, but if you'll trust me, that, that's what we do see. We see changes in chemotaxis of uh, uh, monocytes, and I could show you this data if you're interested. PM 
ultra-fine exposure results in increased systemic oxidative and systemic induction of, of these are transcription factors re regulated antioxidant genes. The ultrafine particles concentrates the air pollution related proatherogenic effects. Ultrafine particle constituents synergize with known proatherogenic mediators and in the induction of a large number of genes relevant in vascular inflammatory processes. And ultrafine particles lead to a loss lead to a systemic effect characterized by increased oxidative stress and loss of the anti-inflammatory properties of HDL. So we have shown, I haven't shown you all the data for all of this, but this is our conclusions. And it appears at this point that the ultrafine particles are really quite striking in their effects. And we did this experiment a year ago and we have, we have just now repeated it and it appears that we have confirmed the results of from, from last year. <clears throat> now, let me race through, because I don't, wanna, I don't really want to hold you up to. This is some work that we did, uh, some of which was ARB funding, and it's work with Mike Kleiman and Art Cho and myself. And <coughs> I want to just show you some results from, from Mike, Mike's animal work to show you some consistent behavior. Previous, we've been interested in not just using genetically altered animals, but we've been interested in old animals as well, namely geriatric rats. So we did some experiments with animals that were 24 to 26 months old, and we were looking at fine particle concentrations. By the way, Whenever I have said today that we're, that we're using, looking at fine particles versus ultrafine, I hope you all understand that what we're really saying is we're looking at fine plus ultrafine plus ultrafine. We can't separate ultrafines out from fine particles. So what you're really seeing and what what's adds real complexity to the issue what you're really seeing when I show you that data is you're really seeing the combination of the effects of fines plus ultrafines. And so I don't want anybody to be confused. And we could talk at length about that. So we uh, implanted uh, blood pressure and EKG transponders. We exposed them to concentrated particles and uh, went through a series of processes, killing them, analyzing for cytokines, looking at macrophages, and so on and so forth. And we found in these animals changes in, distinct changes in blood pressure and distinct changes in heart rate. We found uh, increases in pro-inflammatory cytokines. Now, we also did a series of studies with animals that were 14 months old and in that, in, in, <coughs> in that study, we did not see changes in heart rate in the young animals. We saw arrhythmias that were increased in some but not all animals. But we did see heart rate variability in animals that had been surgically induced uh, with uh, myocardial infarctions and you can see that data there. Those are animals looking at heart rate variability in animals that had uh, been induced for uh, myocardial infarctions. But we didn't see much in the 14-year-old animals. <laughs> we uh, instilled particles into a heart looking at uh, the hemodynamics of the heart and we looked at soluble extracts from the particles, and they had no effects. And we find rather significant. If anybody's interested, I'll go through what each, what each, what what these relate to. LVSP and LVDP relate to blood pressure, systolic and diastolic, DP slash and, D, and DPTDP 
our positive rate of developed pressure and negative rate of developed pressure. So you can see, I think, if you look closely, that we are seeing in these animals, uh, we are seeing changes in these uh, hemodynamic flows. Uh, this is work that is brand new and needs further interpretation. I won't say more about it, but we are seeing effects, uh, but but I would be at a loss uh, standing here to explain uh, what Mike's seen within the context of, of those studies. <laughs> and we have also looked at the brains of animals at uh, 50 meters from a freeway <clears throat> and looked at their brain tissues and sorry. Okay, this is some work of, of Gunter Oberdorster in which he shows uptake of ultrafines in the olfactory region. And I think many of you have seen that work before. It's not new. And this is looking at inflammatory markers in the brain. And Mike was able to see changes in inflammatory markers in the brain as long as two weeks after uh, the, the exposure occurred. So. He would, in, his conclusion would be that geriatric rats exposed near roadways show changes in heart rate, blood pressure, and macrophage responses. Heart rate variability was significantly changed in a second study. Hemodynamic parameters changed, so there's evidence for inflammation and oxidative stress. And he would argue that significant inflammatory responses were observed in brain tissue two weeks after CAPS exposure near the roadway, but not at a remote site. So I think, I think that's more than enough uh, information. And that uh, what I wanted to do was to emphasize really three things. I wanted to show you some of our cardiovascular research that is really, uh, I think, showing great uh, conclusions at this point. I wanted to re-emphasize the importance of the multi-tiered approach to looking at mechanistic pathways in toxicity. And I wanted to show you something about the quinones in terms of, in terms of the exacerbation of asthma, and in, in particular, in terms of looking at vapors as well as particles. And I think I'll leave it at that and open it for questions. Thanks. Right. Thank you, John. Uh, questions? And state your name, please. For the record, it's Melanie Marty. Hi, John. I was just wondering if the difference between uh, lung T10 stuff with the APOE mice and the atherosclerotic lesion and you guys was the difference in length of exposure. So I, I thought I remembered him saying that a shorter exposure, he did not see a difference in the high fat chow animals that took a longer exposure to see an elevation in atherosclerotic lesion area in the high fat diet animals. I think he had a five or six month exposure. Yeah, you guys he had six five months. Weeks. That, that's a very good point. The, I think you're right. Uh, to be quite frank, um, you see, the, I, I don't want to uh, uh, beat up on Rich here, but the uh, the problem we have is we have this damn trailer from Michigan State, and we can only use it. That was my point about being up in this. The problem with the damn thing, and it's nobody's fault, is that Jack Harkema has all these experiments that he's doing. He's doing experiments at Davis as well. So we get this trailer for a short period of time. So the, the problem that you're raising is really an important one. We can't do six-month subchronic studies in California at this point, which is absurd when you think about it. And, and I think that if, if we had let our study gone for six months with a high-fat diet, 
then you'd start to see you'd start to see the dif- you'd start to see differences and if you didn't then it's even more interesting because there's clearly if you look at those antioxidant enzymes there's clearly stuff going on and we're not picking it up and and so i would say that you're probably absolutely right that <coughs> that, <coughs> that that needs to be a six month study at least and Six months in the field is a horrendously difficult task. So I, I'm not sure we need a six-month study, but we, we certainly need more than five weeks anyway. I had another question, if, if you don't mind. The, the loss of the anti-inflammatory properties of HDL in your last experiment, did you guys look at the chemical changes in the HDL to try to figure out why that was? Is it just lipid peroxidation going on, or...? Do you have an idea? No, but I can give you the paper that that has been written about this phenomena by others. Uh, and uh, nobody really knows what's going on, but we do know, n- no, we don't know what's going on. I think that's fair to say. But, but something is going on that's affecting the HDL in terms of its in terms of chemotaxis, and so the the issue, uh, Jake Lucis, you know, is doing, you, you know, Jake Lucis, a geneticist, doing this, some of his work. Um, he's not looking at, I, I don't think he's looking at the HDL chemicals. But the one of the interesting questions is whether or not the particles are themselves oxidizing HDL. That would be really quite interesting because uh, as far as we know, there's no question that there are these two-phase oxidative processes for low-density uh, cholesterol. But, the, but what happens with HDL, your, your guess is as good as mine. But it's, that, that's a, I think that's a whole set of new, new experiments. You start to get into study. Obviously, it, uh, nobody's, uh, everybody understands in this room why we would start out looking at low-density cholesterol because it's the stuff that ends up in the foam cells and ends up in the necrotic cells. And so that's what you're interested in. But obviously, you, in terms of any secondary effects of HDL, it's really quite fascinating. And I would still argue that what we're seeing with the ultrafines is a result of inflammatory compounds capable of, of creating inflammatory responses because they're on the surface of the, of the ultrafines. And the fine particles are just, some of the stuff is less bioavailable. So bioavailability is probably an issue here that needs further in further attention. <coughs> Hi, Joan. Hi, John. Joan Denton. John, the schematic that you showed about the, uh, the development of uh, arterial sclerosis, just to be clear, is the, is the site, are you proposing the site of action for nanoparticles would be within the walls of the artery, that they would penetrate the walls of the artery where the, where the lipoprotein resides and do their oxidative damage there, and then that leads. It's not really with the macrophages or with the foam cell or the necrosis. or what, It's with this actually the lipoprotein element. Perfect question. Perfect question. Uh, uh, here, here's some possibilities. One, ultrafines cause inflammatory responses in the lung. Cytokines and chemokines and other inflammatory markers leave the lung, end up in the heart, and those get taken up into the, into the arteries, the lymphocytes and monocytes and what have you. And so what's happening is what's happening is an effect on the lung like your periodontal problems that also cause heart attack risk 
inflammatory, systemic inflammatory problems produce lymphocytes and monocytes that can be taken up, differentiate into macrophages. The macrophages are full of low density lipid. It, the, those cells die, you form these necrotic cores and blah, blah, blah. And so, and what's happening with a, with a heart attack is starts out in your gums or your lungs or some other place. So that's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis is that these ultrafine particles, are, and the question is fine particles, question mark, but let's just say ultrafines. The ultrafines actually get into the systemic circulation, end up in your heart, and they're taken up in, 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 the, in, the, uh, um, in the heart, and they produce the same effects, the same inflammatory processes. The third alternative is that you breathe these particles and the organics and the metals come off. And so they're then, they're, they are then in the systemic circulation and in the systemic circulation, they then penetrate into the, into the aortic walls. And so you're getting the reaction of the individual chemical constituents of the particles. So those are three options. And to be quite frank, we haven't have any idea whatsoever which of those is right or if that's the only options. But the question's really, the really, the question is really, uh, <coughs> We did some experiments in which we looked at inflammation in the lung when we were doing these animal experiments. We didn't see a lot of inflammation in the lung. Now, short study, Melanie will come back at me. But the point being, we probably haven't done enough yet to know whether we're, we need to look at the inflammatory processes in the lung. But I still am betting that there's that there is some particle uptake in the in the in the uh, in the heart, but that's been very difficult to do. The, the tracing studies, tracer studies that have been done, have not nobody finds them terribly satisfactory. So it's so the answer to the question is, we don't know. I don't think it's just chemicals coming off particles, though. I think it's more complicated than that. But I don't really. But I don't really think we know. Is that is that it? The postmenopausal women observation. I mean, is that? Well, this is one that somehow is, related to this is this is. I think this is going to cause an explosion of research because the question is why postmenopausal women. I mean, that's the $64 question at this point. Why, why are we seeing it in postmenopausal women and not men? And so uh, something's going on that nobody understands. And, and there are questions now being raised about that study. People are wondering, how did we get a 1.76 relative risk? It's so high that... Um, so now, we're, you know how epidemiologists all fight with each other all the time. And so now we're beginning to get the, the uh, uh, you know, wait a minute, let's take a look at this more. But it's, it's, it's pretty striking. Um, and that's a very good, that's a very good group of investigators at the University of Washington. You guys working, they're, you know, yeah, one of the cities is L.A., is... Down our way. We talked to Nelson about the Mesa study. I think that group is working with. But. Yeah, that, that, there. there. Yeah. But the problem, and let, this goes back to my my uh, my harangue, if you'll pardon my expression, the harangue. I don't think when they finish, they're going to know the answers to these kinds of questions because I don't think they're doing the kind of exposure and chemical characterization that's going to give them. The, they're not going to get causal agents out of it. And I think these studies, this, that's a $30 million study. And when they're finished, they're not going to have causality defined. And I think it's a crime, frankly. Um, we didn't apply, so I'm not saying that out of, out of uh, 
<laughs> you know, if we had lost the money, boy, then I really would have been arguing. But no, seriously, uh, all due respect, I I think this issue he, here here's what I think. I wrote the standard for cotton dust when I worked for OSHA way back in the dawn of time, and that we knew that cotton dust had nothing to do with brown lung disease or bisonosis. We knew it was an endotoxin or some sort of biological agent. But we had a study that showed a correlation between cotton dust exposure and bisonosis, and so we set the standard based on cotton dust. Well, cotton dust does not cause bisonosis. We eliminated bisonosis by setting a cotton dust standard. So there are times when you can do things, set standards using surrogates that serve the purpose that you need. So I, I would be the first to say that we, we should use surrogates if they make sense. PM 2.5 is clearly a surrogate. It's not the causal agent for all these studies that we've been following for years and years and years. Although the, the work is showing that when you lower the levels, things get better is an interesting finding. But the point I'm trying to make is that we, we, with, because of developmental effects, cardiovascular effects, allergic airway disease, neurologic effects and all this, we really do need to know more about causality if we're really going to deal with all the endpoints that we have to face. And so this issue, I think, is really a crucial one. And so the issue of how we define causality is really uh, an issue that, as far as I'm concerned, it, sh it should be central to everybody trying to work through these these issues. Other questions here? Now I get to read off some, I guess. That... Let's see. Go ahead, John. I'll let you read those. This is uh, uh, this is the kind of question you really is he on the phone? He's on the webcast. Yeah, Sam, great question. I hate you for it. <laughs> this is from Sam Altscheller, who's a member of the uh, Berkeley Bay Area. Uh, Bay Area Air Quality Management District. He says, is there any reason to believe that there is any difference in health effects as a result of human exposure to PM from wood smoke versus diesel soot? Then he goes on to say, that was the easy part. <laughs> then he goes on to say, how does exposure to vaporize and then condensed lube oil seen as ultrafine PM from engines compared to diesel soot? Those are absolutely great question. In our experience, we find that diesel soot is more active toxicologically than wood, than wood smoke. And we would, we would argue that fossil fuel combustion represents, in our view, a greater problem of toxicity than wood smoke, which isn't to sort of ignore. I mean, let, let, let's call a spade a spade. All PM is toxic. It's a matter of degree. Some is a lot more toxic than others. We're not, we're not talking, I don't know of any PM that's, well, maybe, what, salt off the ocean or something. I mean, maybe there are some pretty benign PM. But in terms of the kinds of things we're talking about, um, we would argue that fossil fuel combustion from mobile sources represents the highest degree of toxicity that what we think is important, and we think ultrafines are the most important within that context, and I admit my bias in that respect. So I, 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 it doesn't mean we should continue to study wood smoke, but we don't think it's, it's the most toxic of the, of the combustion products that, that at least we've seen in our laboratories. 
And this is a good question for coasters to talk. Then, how does exposure to vaporize and then condensed lube oil seen as an ultra-fine PM from com engines compared to diesel soot? That's a research question for us that we're working on. I, I think it may, the issue is, at least if I understand it, is that when you have vapor, vapors, hot vapors, and then they condense and form particles, how does that compare to the particles coming out of the tailpipe itself? And that's, we think that, um, that we, need, we are trying to do a number of studies on the, what Costas calls the volatile PM. You're looking at me strangely. Is he asking a different question? I think that's the question he's asking. I don't know. Yeah. They're, they're <coughs> I can say, and uh, uh, some of it be find this interesting, we're having pretty significant problems with diesel exhaust. It's 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 pretty oily, and it's not. You just don't go put a filter out there or an impinger and collect ultra fines or fines for diesel exhaust, and not have to worry about agglomeration and oil formation. This is this is a very complex issue that I think we don't even we barely know the beginnings of how complex it really is. And, uh, and uh, we did some studies where we, when we did the redox, act, all those assays that I brag about, and when we got the results, we got nothing. And the reason we got nothing is everything was agglomerating, and we weren't getting, we weren't measuring ultrafines, we were measuring gook. And so, and we're not too interested in gook. So that, this is a very, very important question, I think, and I, and I don't know the answer to it, but I think it's a question that needs, it really needs study. And, of course, the issue of, is, are the particles that, that are the result of condensation of vapors, are they more toxic, less toxic, or where are they relative to what comes out of the tailpipe is a really key question. One could argue that those particles are going to have a lot of organics, on the surface and maybe more toxic, but it's a it's still a research question. It's not a regulatory question. And is the catalytic process used in our vehicles responsible for the generation of these hydroxyls? Uh, I don't know. Somebody know? Somebody's an engineer know more? It's more of an emission control kind of a question. Yeah, it's not a good question for me. I'm the biological guy. Do you have an answer, Ralph? Mm -hmm. well, uh, your question, I'll, 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 I'll um, okay, Ralph Proper, ARB. Uh, 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 with reference to your earlier question, I'm not sure exactly what Sam meant, but, uh, but the question that it prompts for me is uh, uh, based on a paper by Eric Fujita recently, uh, okay. there's a lot of reason to be concerned about uh, uh, lube uh, in, in cars or, 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 or diesel vehicles, the uh, burning lube oil, burning, you know, the smoking uh, vehicles, yeah. uh, that the exposure to those PM might be more important than exposure to, uh, to diesel exhaust per se. So, so uh, I don't know if that's what he meant, but uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, th this is one where what I'd say is um, let's just say the jury is out, but <coughs> As <re> some of you know, Costas and I are about to begin a major dynamometer study of how many vehicles, a dozen vehicles, ten vehicles, do you know? But we're going to look at maybe as many as ten different vehicles, and obviously these questions will be paramount in that study here. We're going to do it uh with ARB and to try and sort out these questions. I think this is, I think this study may be more important than anything else I can think of at this point because it's, uh, because we're going to be doing toxicity in relation to characterization of these oils and particles and what have you. And 
So it's going to run for four years and looking at a whole range of vehicles, new technologies, old technologies. And, but it's not just testing vehicles. It's going to be testing the kinds of questions that are coming up here about the nature of these particles, lube oil, uh, condensed, condensed vapors, and, and what have you. But to go back to this question of the Europeans tell me that they can get rid of vapors in their catalytic process, but whether or not we're seeing, we know that 1,2-naphthoquinone is produced in the engine combustion process. Whether or not the catalytic converter has anything to do with it, uh, he's shaking his head it does. It may, it, you would think that a catalytic converter would result in some oxidative processes, but I think we're not, I, I don't know the answer. What do you think? Huh? Yeah, uh, the, because obviously what we don't want to do, what we don't want to do is to take PAHs that are produced in combustion and oxidize them to quinones because that's like doing the, the dirty work for us. And so the question of whether we're going to get these, whether we're going to get quinones and other, you know, carbonyl-like compounds like acrolein and crotonaldehyde and all those, and a whole bunch of others, is, is still is a, is a technology question. So let, let me just ask one too, John. One of our research priorities is age versus fresh particles. And I'm thinking um, how this relates to, it seems to me, is also um, the effect of, actually we've seen as traffic itself and those people living nearest the traffic. Have you done studies that have really looked at, uh, tried to look at that? Yeah. The difference between age versus fresh relative toxicities? Uh, I don't know if Costas is doing that with Ralph now. I'll find out for you. You know, we have a panel study of some 80 people who have cardiovascular impairment. And clearly that's an important question that, that, that I don't know the answer to, and I'll find out and let you know. Because... Okay. <coughs> it's a huge... It's, I, I, I don't know. Yes, but what? But whether? But whether they're doing some of the stuff that they've already done in terms of volatile and non-volatile compounds? They're. I don't think they are either. I, I mean, I don't know of it, and if I, I, I if I don't know it, it probably means they are, because I would have. The, 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 the Delfino panel study is really very fancy chemistry, but it shows you how difficult it is to do a comprehensive study uh, in, in with 75 people and do the genetics and do the ox, oxidized low-density lipoprotein. I mean, we're really taking on an enormous task on that in that study because we're, we're we're trying to find out about those LDL all those funny pictures that that she's asking about and <clears throat> with and we've got 75 people Professor um, I enjoyed your seminar very much my name is Jim Lerner I work in aviation related emissions and I know you've, uh, for the last year or two, been working on trying to understand the ultrafines from commercial jets. And so my question relates to, do we know enough about the ultrafines and those that are exposed out in the neighborhoods to, to say we should be looking into the toxicity, or do we still need to do more fundamental research on the nature of the particle and these older particles that, that are seen out yonder compared to what's seen uh, by the blast vents? Well... 
It's, a, it's an entry of, of all the questions that come popping up. And Rich is just sitting there right next to you. Yeah. <laughs> we are trying to get final approval of our study. And we are at fair, I don't know if Ralph and, and Rich would agree, but I think we are at a microscopic distance between approval and completion. That's, that's a really positive statement. <coughs> and, <coughs> and so I have not said a word to anybody about our report because the, I keep getting a, all these people who want to know what's in our report. There's a whole bunch of activist groups in L.A. just waiting for this damn thing to come out. Yeah. And so, so I, I've been... You know, holding the 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 tide, you know, of the of the back, but for two reasons: one, because we haven't got approval on our project yet, and uh, but that'll that's work working out. But the other thing is, we we um, we want to write some peer-reviewed publications, and we have to worry a little bit about if we start putting stuff out in the press. Is that is somebody going to say your no your data is no longer fresh and no longer publishable. So we've had to worry about that. I think that this study of ours is there's so much interest. I think we're going to have to basically release it. ARB, I think, is interested in it being in, in the public eye and, um, and have actually at some meetings talked about it a little bit. And so, but uh, <coughs> in my view, <coughs> It's still, it was a pilot study. This was a $118,000 study. My PM center, the first go around, was $15 million. So, I mean, keep it in mind the differences. And so we think we've learned an enormous amount. Um, and I think what we've learned suggests that there's a distinct need for much more research and, and I don't say that as some academic wanting to say we need more research and more money and all that. I couldn't care less. What I'm saying is I think that we've learned enough to now understand some of the questions that we weren't able to answer. And so the answer is um, uh, yes, absolutely there's need for more work. I think we're going to be surprised at some of the answers I think the chemical composition, tell me if you think this, if you agree. I think the chemical composition from aircraft is going to look different than the chemical composition from diesel vehicles. And it, it may be like we never did any quinones in this study. So we don't know whether getting oxygenated, if you take all this black carbon, and it's being heated at these very high temperatures. I don't know if there if there are quinones being formed. There's a professor at, at, at Johns Hopkins who says when you burn black carbon, you get quinone-like structures. They're not individual chemicals, but they're they're complicated structures. So, in some ways, I would say that the, the, the issue of oxygenation of black carbon from from the from the tail from the jet engines is an issue. I think how far, what's the distance of penetration from a jet aircraft versus a car? We we really don't quite know yet. We have some ideas, but those things, quite frankly, put out a lot of thrust. Yeah. So. I'm not answering your question. I'm trying. What I'm not. I'm not trying to not answer it. What I'm trying to. No, no, no. I. I, I wouldn't do that. I, I, what I'm trying to say is, there. I think there are a series of questions that a group of people now has to sit down and really talk through, and not just go do another bigger bunch of emission studies. Because I don't think we'll get. I don't think we'll answer all the questions that need to be answered if we do that. So, so I worry about subsequent studies that measure more of the same. 
you agree with that? Saying, we have to be, I think each study has to somehow learn from itself. And that's why I made this big play about we need to do is, and you realize, given what I said in my talk, the most obvious thing that you would expect me to say now is we should be doing toxicology on emissions, not just looking at the emissions. How do you know how toxic those those ultrafines are? There's a ton of ultrafines. Now, how do how do we know how toxic they are? No. Is anybody planning to do a study to measure toxicity of ultrafines from aircraft? No. The answer, well, it's not his fault. No, I, my, no, 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 but if it was up to him, he would. It's, Thank you. Yeah. No, no, no. Know your friends and your enemies. He's not our, he's our friend. The, the, the point being that I th the thing is that it's so amazing after everything that we've talked about to, net, to say, gee, shouldn't we do some kind of study that threw a bunch of animals out there or did some chemical assays or did some biological assays? Why is it that the only thing we ever do is measure emissions? Because it doesn't answer the question in the long run. That's my view. And I, 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 I am not unbiased on this. I am totally biased on it. So, yeah. So I almost have to agree with some of that because I think what we've done is almost a stepwise approach where we've looked at the emissions, you know, aviation fuels pretty close to diesel fuel. Um, of course, the combustion process is quite a bit different. Um, so your study, really, is just kind of getting your toes wet and dipping yeah. your feet into it. And you're right, just looking at the some of the emissions, downwind impacts, um, just a bit of it. But you're right, looking at what you put up today and looking at some of the diesel and some of the other PM, I think you almost have to get into some of the toxicology and say, are we, you know, how do these things differ? So Even if you just did some of the little assays like we did, did one, one, one day, one, one week of sample collection, you, you know a thousand fold more than you do now. Which is, when you think about it, is really crazy to be in 2007 and not have an, ever done a simple chemical assay on toxicity. Yeah, Kane? is uh, a, a better a, a shot at what exposures are like because, you know, you, you can't go from <coughs> gel pipes to <coughs> cellular tests without knowing the relevance of those cellular tests and the relevance of the of tailpipe yeah. studies. And the, the airport, LAX area and other airports is a really rich area for understanding exposure. We, the, the other thing we have to do, that people who do field studies, you'll appreciate this, is we got to figure out how to do them so we don't destroy all our goddamn equipment. All our equipment is gone is is a mess because the levels were so high at that at the blast fence that we're still suffering. I got two emails yesterday from people in Costas's lab saying, "Who's going to pay for fixing these instruments?" Uh, so do you realize when you're at the blast fence at LAX? You're producing huge amounts of material, and 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 our instruments are saying, oh. <laughs> it's yeah, yeah, and it may be. I hate I, I hate to say this. I hate to say this because Ralph and Rich will come back and tell me they said it before, and I think you did too. It may be that we might have been a little, we might have done the study a little further away. Or I don't know, I don't know what the right answer to that is, but we may have been a little up close. You, you think we were up close? <laughs> no, I mean, call us, say, I, I think we were, we put ourselves into a box with such heavy exposures, don't, don't you think? And but you can only 
un, you only come to the grace of God, you know, after some experience. And so we have some experience now. And I, I, if I did it over again, I'd want to be further away. Definitely. I think that's why I said it's getting your feet wet, knowing exactly what you're going to run into with some of these. But there's a lot of particles. <laughs> there's a very uh, complicated question. Indeed. This is a very good question, and I, I should be the first. The first thing I'm going to say is I'm not a physician, and I'm especially not a clinician. Um, so You're not getting any easy questions answer, off the way. The answer, to, in part, is I don't know what I'm talking about. Persons taking amiodarone for arrhythmia occasionally suffer pulmonary fibrosis. Inasmuch as the ultrafines lodge in the alveoli and liberate inflammatory cytokines, could it not be possible that the circulating amiodarone may amplify the inflammatory effect of the ultrafines and bring about the significant fibrosis? Could not an experiment be set up with rabbits, dogs, or rats, rabbits, or dogs in which some am amiodarone were kept in a were kept in a filtered envir air environment, and others were <coughs> given the material in, in an unfiltered environment plus controls to determine if am am amiodarone accelerates the fibrotic process in the presence of ultrafines. It, it sounds like an interesting experience. I think you would need a different audience, unless there's a physician in here who Sounds like a good, it sounds like a study that needs John Bombs or somebody who's a clinician to review it. So it's a very applied, uh, yeah. Sounds interesting. I, I never heard of it. So that it's has anybody ever heard of amiodarone? Rush Blodgett, thank you for the question. Just shows you the success of your webcasts that they're getting these kinds of questions. That's really great. We get, we think we're getting some... Actually, that your presentation was great, so it's raised a lot of issues, I think, with people who have uh, thought how this results of what you've done so far interact in a real practical sense, an applied sense to uh, the questions. Thanks. Any other questions? I think I'd like to thank John. Thank you again for coming in a great presentation, and especially coming here with a cold and uh, Actually, I didn't even notice the difference. I think you did a fine job. So uh, I want to thank you all again for coming.